So I, my name is Brandon Westover. I'm a neurologist and I have a PhD in physics. And um, I want to start by asking, uh, raise your hand if you had a good night's sleep last night. All right, and anyone who had trouble sleeping or wish they could have slept better, raise your hand. Actually, I see more hands for the second question. And so everybody knows what it's like to have a bad night of sleep. Uh, you, you, the next day you feel crummy and your brain doesn't work as well as it, as it ought to. And over a lifetime of bad sleep, uh, if you don't, don't fix the problem, you're at higher risk for heart disease and dementia, in fact. Um, one in five people will have a clinically diagnosable sleep problem, and uh, to get that diagnosis, uh, you go to a sleep lab, and it's very important that you get it diagnosed because we have treatment. So what happens uh, in a sleep lab? Well, you'll get a bunch of sensors on your head to measure your brain activity, some on your chest and abdomen to measure breathing. There will be sensors on your legs to measure your leg movements because those can indicate uh, neurologic disease. You'll get an oximeter, and with all these wires on, uh, the technologist will put you in a bed and dim the lights and ask you to please sleep normally. <laughs> and uh, believe it or not, most people do sleep. And in the morning, uh, they'll take all this off and you'll go home, and then the technologist, with their years of training and experience, will uh, sift through this data meticulously and they'll annotate it. And so for the brain data, every 30 seconds gets a label, uh, awake, REM sleep, or stage N1, 2, or 3, or non-REM sleep. Your breathing data will get marked every time you pause breathing or uh, you stop breathing, uh, and maybe your oxygen goes down, it'll be labeled as an apnea event and uh, categorized, and your leg movements will get scored. And then all of this data later gets reviewed again by a physician who will uh, make a diagnosis and, and maybe prescribe a treatment to help you. Um, now, this is the way we've done this for decades, right? And there's, but there's some things we can do much better now that we have, we're in the age of artificial intelligence and powerful computers. So the first thing, and these are things that we've, we've done, I'll tell you about, is to change this from a very manual, tedious process with some subjectivity into an automated process. Second thing is that a lot of these you know, studies could be done at home, and in fact, a lot of them need to be because many people don't get a diagnosis. Um, and so we can make this, uh, possible to do at home by miniaturizing it. And finally, uh, a lot of people don't need a clinical diagnosis, but really are interested in the health of their sleep and, in fact, the health of their brain. So I'll tell you how we've gone beyond conventional sleep analysis uh, to, to give that to people. So let me first start with uh, automation. All right, so we've developed a deep neural network uh, based on the world's largest set of clinical, and it's important that they're clinical because these are uh, sleep recordings that are from 10,000 subjects who come into the sleep lab, all ages, all uh, you know, from healthy to very ill. So the world's largest set of sleep data to train this deep neural network, and it uh, reproduces what the technologists ordinarily do in the morning, except it does it much faster and with no subjectivity. So I'm going to show you how well this works. So here's a, an agreement matrix um, showing you uh, on the bottom is the uh, stages assigned by the sleep expert. On the y-axis by our deep neural network, we call it SleepNet2. And if you take, for example, uh, REM sleep, um, the percent agreement between algorithm and expert is 92%. And if you go down this diagonal, agreements are all actually better uh, than you get usually between any two experts. So this is, this is as good or better and generally better uh, than, than we can do manually. Uh, similarly, for apnea detection, so on the, on the x-axis, we're counting how many apneas per hour of sleep are detected by the expert versus the deep neural network, and you can see they agree very well. And similarly, for limb movement detection. And so what we have here is a way to completely automate the process uh, of analyzing conventional sleep data. And this, actually, I, I won't show you, but it can be done with smaller number of sensors, which is very important uh, to do in the home. Now, the other thing that's important if we want to do home studies, uh, this brings me to our, my second uh, point, is you notice all these different sensors. This takes a trained person to put these on. We can't do, you can't expect somebody to do this themselves for a sleep test at home. And so we, we need to miniaturize this. So we've developed a, a miniaturized uh, sensor. And so th that's a nickel. If, if I, many of you haven't seen one for a while, here's a nickel. So it's about this big, and you can just put this, uh, stick it on your forehead and monitor brain activity while you sleep. And this is the uh, proto actual prototype here uh, shown. Right, now the third, the third uh, way we've gone going beyond uh, actually conventional sleep analysis, uh, we call this the brain age index or brain age algorithm. 
And uh, this allows people to, who maybe don't have a clinical need but just want to monitor the health of their sleep and, and the health of their brain, a way to do that. And I need to tell you a little story to, to explain how we got to this. So after we did our automated sleep analysis, we thought, oh, wouldn't it be interesting um, if you could predict how old a person is just from their overnight brain activity? And this, this has some plausibility because, as everyone knows, infants and you know, middle-aged adults and elderly people, there they sleep differently. And in fact, if you look at the details, the brain activity is very different. So we, we tried this, and we developed an artificial intelligence you know, algorithm that could, that could actually do this quite well. And so I'm showing you a picture here. Uh, so chronologic age versus the uh, EEG predicted age. And it works really well. And so I was so excited about this, I told my wife, and uh, she said, what are you doing? You can just ask people how old they are. And that, that's fair enough, but the interesting thing is actually, what if you're a 50-year-old and your brain to the algorithm looks like you're a 60-year-old, right? Or, or looks younger than you really are. So what does this mean? Well, it's an indicator of brain health. So to, to help convince you of that, um, here's the distribution of this brain age index. That's predicted age minus chronologic age. And this is for a, patient, a group of patients who have no chronic illnesses that we know of. Uh, Overlaid on here is patients with diabetes and hypertension, diseases that accelerate brain aging. And you can see there's a shift of the group about four years. They look four years older to the algorithm. And so if, if you knew this, you might be able to do something about it and hopefully shift it. Here's another group. They're, they're, this is from uh, 3,000 patients who went through a clinical trial and got sleep studies, and then they were followed until they died. And their survival curves are very interestingly different. So patients who had a young-looking brain when they got their uh, sleep study, compared to an older one, have a 26% chance, uh, the, the younger ones have a 26% chance, um, high, higher chance of living until they're age 87. All right, so this goes well beyond conventional sleep uh, staging and counting you know, how long you've slept and st or stayed in bed. Um, and it gives you really a way to monitor the health of your brain in addition to the conventional sleep staging. Now, we're the only ones really doing this, so, so we're, we're looking for partners, and, and we have a, a distinct advantage that you should know about. So we, we have clinical and AI knowledge that we've brought together. We have unique algorithms. Uh, even if we told you exactly how the algorithms work, though, we have the world's largest set of, of clinically relevant sleep data. Again, uh, this, this is important for uh, generalization of an algorithm to, to people it hasn't seen with you know, different ages and different health conditions. And just as a kind of... Uh, taste of uh, what the competition maybe looks like. You know, so here's some of the groups that offer uh, some uh, ways to monitor your sleep. There's the Apple Bedit monitor. This is a little thing you put under your, under your mattress. Uh, ResMed Plus is a, a kind of a radar device you put near your bedside. Um, and then Somneris and Nokia. And none of these really, actu actually none of these even monitor your brain signals. They try to do this indirectly, uh, which won't let them do the brain age. They're, none of them have this big data set uh, that's clinically relevant to validate it on as well. Um, we think there's at least three markets. So there's a clinical market in the US alone between ambulatory and in hospital, about a $6 billion market in the world. It's less, well, less done and less well reimbursed, so currently about a $1 billion market. Pharmaceutical companies needing to monitor the effects of their drugs on sleep. We estimate a $100 million market. And then this M Health market is huge, $8 billion. This includes Fitbit and Apple Watch. And uh, of course, some of that is wanting to monitor sleep and brain health. Uh, we're seeking funding to take these uh, algorithms and our prototype and turn these into an integrated system. So the, the data would go into the cloud, it would be analyzed and displayed back to either physicians or, or patients or just consumers uh, who want to track their sleep. Uh, we need to commercialize device, and uh, although it's not needed at the beginning, ultimately we want this to function really kind of without the need for a doctor, and for that uh, we need uh, help getting to the FDA. So I'm, I'm happy to uh, talk in the back for anyone uh, who'd, who might be interested in partnering or who has additional questions. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks.